Yeah, so um, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. So really, really glad to be here. So um, it's actually very good that, that I'm speaking after um, the, 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 first, the first lecture because I don't need to cover all the background about neural networks. So I will be mainly talking about um, uh, deep learning on graphs. So it will be a particular type of neural networks that might have certain uh, type of architecture, but uh, maybe let me start your start from a little bit uh, from a, um, a little bit of historical background and um, to give you a context about where um, graph neural networks come from. And um, I think it's probably not an exaggeration to say that, that the concept of symmetry has been uh, very crucial in many fields of mathematics. And uh, Weil, uh, in this quote, uh, spoke very poetically about it in his book that is titled Symmetry. And um, it's a geometric notion, right, that uh, goes back to uh, ancient Greece. So uh, Plato, for example, believed that, that uh, symmetric uh, uh, shapes that we nowadays call platonic solids were the build basic building blocks of the universe, which is not very far from uh, how crystals are uh, uh, nowadays understood in the modern field of, uh, field of crystallography. And geometry itself, we can trace it back to, to the ancient Greeks. Uh, Euclid formulated in an axiomatic way um, geometry that we still teach as the geometry at school, the Euclidean geometry, and as you probably know, uh, it had uh, this kind of special postulate about uh, parallel lines that, that uh, more than a thousand years, uh, many illustrious mathematicians uh, tried to prove to, to no avail until the, the 19th century, where came the realization finally that you can actually construct other self-consistent geometries that do not rely on the, on the postulate of Parallels and this created an entire zoo of different um, of different geometric constructions that somehow were disconnected from each other, and uh, it was not clear uh, how to unify them and how to define uh, what actually is meant by by a geometry. And uh, in 1872, uh, Felix Klein addressed this problem by uh, introducing what entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, where he suggested treating uh, geometries as a space with some group of transformations that is attached to it and studying properties of shapes that remain uh, invariant under these translations, right? And if you think of Euclidean geometry, it basically it arises from the group of rigid motions. So Euclidean group, so you can take an object that you can translate, rotate, or reflect it. And uh, it, these kind of transformations preserve a lot of uh, properties like areas, uh, parallelism of lines, intersections, and so on. And uh, this was a very profound impact, uh, not only in geometry, but also in other fields of mathematics, so more abstract concepts such as category theory, and probably mostly in uh, physics, where came the realization uh, about uh, more than 100 years ago, in the beginning of the 20th century, that you can actually derive physics from these considerations. The famous theorem by uh, Amy Neuter stated that in physical systems, you can associate conservation laws with, uh, with symmetry. and uh, under a certain evolution in the 20th century, this uh, culminated in what nowadays we call the, the standard model uh, in particle physics. So more or less all the physics that at least we currently understand can be derived from, from these considerations. And uh, the, these are, for example, the groups that are associated with, uh, with the standard model. So the external symmetries of the, the space-time, the Poincaré group that gives rise to the Minkowski geometry in special relativity, and the different groups that are related to the uh, to the different uh, uh, fields or different types of uh, forces or interactions. So I think Philip Anderson, Nobel laureate in physics, formulated it very laconically that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, what does it have to do with uh, deep learning? So there is at least one analogy between uh, the situation that happened in geometry in the 19th century in Fort Klein and uh, the situation that we also have historically in uh, in the field of deep learning is this zoo of different architectures that were, were developed for different types of data from different considerations even by people working in different fields, like for example, convolutional neural networks that were developed uh, for uh, image analysis in computer vision or recurrent neural networks that were developed um, for the analysis of time series and sequences. And it's not clear what is uh, the common denominator of uh, these problems are. So the, the idea of geometric deep learning and uh, with uh, Peter and other collaborators, we uh, uh, we wrote a, a big paper that, that eventually will become a book that uh, we try to approach uh, similarly to, to Klein's Erlangen program uh, these different architectures from the perspective of group theory. So we want uh, basically to bring geometric foundations that allow to derive uh, from from the first principles 
existing architectures as well as, the, as invent new architectures for different new problems. So if we look at the problem of uh, supervised machine learning, right, and uh, covered it very nicely in his talk. So in a very simple setting, we have uh, some input space, let's say images of, let's say cats and dogs, right? So in this case, it's a binary classification problem. And we want to, uh, to apply some black box to these inputs and produce, uh, in this case, binary labels, right? So we are basically talking about some high dimensional function approximation problem, right? So some people cynically say that deep learning is just glorified curve fitting, so which is probably true to some extent, right? The, and of course, the question is how you do it. So what you put in this black box and uh, a candidate that, that was considered already from the, the late 50s are uh, neural networks, right? Neural networks. Uh, uh, like the, the this perceptron that was introduced by Rosenblatt in 57. So we know about these neural networks that if you connect just two layers, you get a property that is called universal approximation. So any continuous function can be approximated to any desired accuracy, right? So basically they are extremely expressive. You can do more or less anything, anything you want. Probably they can even make it by, right? So it's just enough to have uh, to have two layers. The problem, of course, that these kind of results they are not uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of existence theorems. They don't tell you how to do it, right? And of course, a uh, big question is how many neurons you need in such uh, in such neural networks and uh, how exactly to choose their ones, right? So it doesn't really provide a constructive answer. It just tells you that such, uh, such an architecture exists. The problem is that uh, if we look at the, uh, at how to uh, approximate a function from a finite sample of training examples, we have, of course, infinitely many uh, possibilities, right? So we need to introduce some kind of assumptions about our functions, uh, what mathematicians call regularity. And we uh, soon discover that the standard notions of regularity that, that are typically assumed in, uh, in approximation theory, such as Lipschitz continuity, do not work well in this, uh, in this setting. So if I take very well uh, behave very nice functions, such as Lipschitz continuous functions, and I increase the dimensionality of my input, I will see that they don't scale well with the dimension, so the, the scaling will be will be exponential, and basically I will get meaningless results. I will uh, I can make statements like that to to get an approximation error of epsilon, I need something like one uh, over epsilon to the power d, where d is the dimension of samples, and even for uh, modest dimensionalities that, that we uh, we deal with in in machine learning, maybe a few hundreds or a few thousand dimensions, these numbers will be huge. So so. That's, there are not uh, enough cat and dogs around to, to, to use them as examples. And this is probably best seen in computer vision applications where the, the input is an image. So you can see that I can just parse it as a vector and feed it into, the, into this kind of multi-layer perceptron neural network. But somehow we throw away all the geometric structure of the image, right? So if I give you the same digits just shifted by one pixel, you see that this vector representation of the input will be very different. And as a result, uh, I need somehow to guarantee that uh, the neural network will recognize these images in the same way, in the sense that it will produce the same output for all these shifted inputs. And if I don't uh, uh, incorporate it into the architecture, I need to show a lot of examples uh, to the neural network uh, to, to train it to, to recognize all the versions of the digit three as the same output, right? And this is what we call data augmentation in, in modern deep learning terminology. And uh, this consideration, well, one of these considerations gave rise to a new type of architectures that, that became popular in computer vision, initially inspired by works in neuroscience about the organization of the visual cortex, which uh, culminated in um, the, the, the classical convolutional neural networks introduced by uh, Jan Lekan, and he probably can take the credit for making them, uh, making the first practical applications of these architectures in, uh, uh, in the context of computer vision. So basically, if you look at what convolutional neural networks do, so the main idea is that they uh, use uh, shared weights that they apply across the image. Uh, and um, the, the underlying mathematical idea behind is that, that uh, we don't treat our input as just a d-dimensional vector. So we treat it as a signal that lives on some low dimensional geometric domain. In this case, it's agreed. And with this domain, we can associate some symmetry group, for example, the group of translations in this example. Right, and um, basically the translation uh, group acts on points on the domain and through some representation, it can also act on signals on it. And then what we require from our architecture from this uh, 
box that is uh, that I write here and call f. So that's the, the, the function that we are trying to, to implement this neural network. We want it to respect the symmetry in some way. And the way, what I mean by respecting, uh, either in the form of invariance or equivalence. So I want the function to be to provide the same output, no matter how I transform the input by the group, or I want uh, the output to be transformed in the same way, right? And this basically gives a very general blueprint to, to design uh, uh, deep learning architectures. So we have these uh, uh, four different objects. So we have the domain, we have the symmetry group associated to it, we have the space of signals living on the domain, and we have the functions that uh, take as inputs uh, these signals. And we can choose differently these different components, right? So for example, for even for images, I don't necessarily need to stick to the translation group. I can think of, for example, also translations and rotations. Uh, the type of representation I use to depend on the data. So for example, a vector data or a scalar data, they will uh, typically transform differently. Uh, the, the group will act on them in a different way. And then uh, the, the, the functions that are implemented as a neural network, uh, will need to respect uh, invariance and equivalence. So the convolutional neural networks that I showed are one example. In, the, in this case, uh, the translation group acts for the shift operator on the signals on the grid, and then convolution is the linear equivalent with respect to this group. What I will be talking about today are graph neural networks. So here the underlying symmetry is the permutation of the nodes of the graph. We typically don't have a canonical way of ordering the nodes of the graph. So any permutation or any uh, arbitrary numbering of the nodes will do. And as we'll see, message passing is a way of implementing this symmetry. So it is baked into the architecture, and uh, therefore uh, the, the architecture is uh, equivalent or invariant under permutation by, by design. And this is a broad idea, so we can apply this kind of blueprint to different uh, geometric objects, whether it's grids, uh, graphs, or maybe more exotic things like, like manifolds. And uh, what we show, uh, in our paper is that uh, uh, you can actually uh, see many popular architectures from, from this perspective. But today, as I mentioned, I would like to talk about graphs. And I don't hopefully need to convince you that, that graphs are interesting objects. So graphs are used as a mathematical abstraction for more, almost anything from very small scales like molecules to very large scales like, like social networks, right? So any system of pairwise relations and interactions can be modeled as, as a graph. Now, uh, the typical types of problems that we are interested in uh, when learning on graphs are um, either graph level problems. So I give you a graph that represents, let's say, a molecule, and then I'm trying to predict its physical property, like solubility or toxicity, which is a very common problem in virtual drug screening. We can also deal with uh, node-wise problems. So I give you a graph, for example, representing the social network, and we want to detect uh, spammers, so some bad actors on, on this social network. Or we can also work on um, problems of the type of uh, what is called link prediction. So I would like to, to uh, determine whether two nodes should be connected by an edge in the graph. And this is also typical in applications um, in social networks, for example, uh, recommend systems. So if I can suggest uh, a user of a social network whom to follow. Right? So what are graph neural networks? These are essentially parametric functions that work on graph structured data. So typically, you are given the input as a graph with features defined on the nodes or maybe on the edges. And we have a parametric function that takes uh, this information and outputs something. Right? So if you consider graph classification problems, so this, for example, can be a number, right? like toxicity of a molecule. And uh, different graph neural networks uh, differ in the way that these functions are implemented. So the majority of uh, architectures uh, follow what is called the message passing paradigm. So in this case, this function is constructed by uh, a sequence of layers where every node looks at what uh, the features of its neighbors and aggregates them in some way. And this aggregation is done by an operator that is, uh, that is symmetric, so it's permutation invariant. And by this design, basically, the, the, the network respects the, the, the permutation symmetry that, that I mentioned in the beginning. And the way that this aggregation works, it can also be split in rough uh, three flavors. So the first one what is called convolutional layer. We just uh, aggregate the information from the nodes with coefficients that depend only on the structure of the graph. So if the aggregation operator is a sum and the graph is a grid, we get the classical convolution. right? So that's why it's called the convolutional flavor. So in convolutional architectures, the aggregation depends uh, not on the features, but only on the structure of the graph. Uh, slightly more general flavor is attentional flavor. So the classical representative in this category is the paper of Penner, uh, the graph attention networks, or GUTs. 
So again, here you can think of a sum summation of the neighbor nodes, but the coefficients that weight these uh, features depend on the features themselves, right? And typically this is implemented for the attention mechanism. And the most general case is the generic message passing where we have a bivariate function that takes the features of the node and the neighbor and somehow transforms them. And, and this is a message that is sent from the neighbor that is then aggregated and is used to update the feature of the node itself. And then we can repeat this process multiple times and uh, uh, we get representations of the nodes that we can aggregate and then produce an output for the entire graph if this is the, the task that we are trying to solve. So an important uh, result about uh, what actually, what are the types of functions that, that can be implemented in this way, and this is related to the previous talk, is uh, the formal relation between message passing and uh, graph isomorphism testing. So in particular, it was shown and probably was known before, but uh, the, the results in the graph neural network literature are from 2019, showing that under some technical assumptions, uh, if you choose the aggregator operator uh, appropriately, then message passing neural networks are at most as expressive as device for element graph isomorphism test. So the device for element graph isomorphism test, what it does, it looks at the graph and it tries to, uh, to label uh, the, uh, every node in the graph based on the uh, structure of its name, right? So you can start with this graph, right? And these are uh, examples of two graphs. So here I have two types of neighborhoods, right? So I have nodes with two neighbors and nodes with three neighbors. So if I apply some uh, uh, hashing function or an injective function to, to these uh, structures, then you will see that I can distinguish between them, right? So these will, I can refine the labels and I will get uh, now two different types of neighbors. I can repeat this procedure now I have uh, uh, three types of neighborhoods, and these will become uh, new colors in this graph. But at some point, this color refinement procedure will stop, and we can output the, the distribution of these uh, colors, and this will be a kind of graph level descriptor, uh, and it will uh, allow us, presumably, to distinguish between different graphs. So the, the theorem uh, says that if uh, the distributions are different, then the graphs are not isomorphic. So we cannot find an age-preserving projection between the nodes. But if the distributions are the same, we actually don't know. So it's uh, a necessary but insufficient condition for graph isomorphism. And this is actually an example here, right? So these graphs are not isomorphic, but the vice element test cannot uh, distinguish between them. So basically, the situation is that from the theoretical perspective, we have this equivalence, right, that allows us to talk about expressive power of graph neural network, right? Saying that message passing is upper bounded by the device for element test. On the practical side, we have, first of all, this problem that uh, not everything can be tested by, uh, by the, the, the simple uh, WO test. And on the other hand, some graphs might be unfriendly for message passing. So imagine that you need to solve a problem on this graph for, that requires you to send information from this block to this block. Right? So uh, you will need to squeeze all the information into this bottleneck, right? into this single edge that connects these two clicks and you might lose information on the way. So we'll formalize it uh, towards the end of the talk and uh, uh, we'll re relate it to a phenomenon that we call uh, over squashing. So to address the first problem, you can do uh, many different things. For example, you can, re you can resort to a, a hierarchy of um, increasingly more expressive um, uh, vice fair element tests, so what is called KWO. So there are uh, certain graphs that these tests cannot distinguish, but each of the subsequent tests is uh, increasingly more expressive. And you can design uh, graph neural network architectures that uh, follow or mimic these, uh, uh, th these tests. For example, the standard message passing, as we said, is equivalent to the, to the classical WO test or one WO, but you can design also KWO equivalent uh, uh, architectures that are more expressive, of course, at the expense of, uh, of computational and, and memory complexity. On uh, the problem of um, graphs being unfriendly for message passing, what you can do is decouple the computational graph from the input graph. And this is a, a class of techniques that are called graph rewiring. So you say that if I don't like this graph because it's hard to send messages on it, so let's maybe introduce a few extra edges to, to facilitate the flow of information. And of course, there is a gap between the theory and practice because the device for element uh, uh, formalism assumes that the graph that you use to propagate information is exactly the same as the input graph. So it doesn't really allow you to change the graph. So we want, uh, we want to address this, this problem as well. So if you look at uh, 
basically graph neural networks and this broader landscape of different architectures uh, that are used within this uh, broad concept of graph neural networks. So uh, the classical approach says that you are given an input graph, you propagate information on this graph, and this way you can compute maybe some functions on this graph. You can, of course, augment um, uh, the graph with some extra structures. For example, you can use positional encoding, right? That's encode somehow the, 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 the position of the node in the graph or maybe some structure that surrounds it. You can also lift the graph into higher dimensional topological spaces, such as, for example, cellular complexes or maybe build uh, cellular ships on, on, these, uh, on these complexes. You can also consider, the, instead of a graph, a collection of subgraphs that are extracted by some policy and then do message passing in, in a coordinated way between them. And this breaks these kind of uh, structural, uh, local structural similarities that limit the expressive power of WL. Uh, you can also account for the symmetries of the data. So this is very common nowadays in molecular modeling, where your graph also has uh, a geometric implementation. So we have continuous coordinates for the nodes. And this is a framework that was used, for example, uh, in the DeepMind's AlphaFold 2. And uh, finally, when the graph uh, has regular structure like degree, then basically some of these operations boil down to, to, to classical uh, convolutions, as I mentioned. So the common... Uh, mindset of these uh, approaches is that somehow you introduce more structure. Either you make it up, or maybe it comes some, some, as some extra information. The other way that you can consider different types of graph neural networks is how much of the input graph information you use. Right? So in the very extreme case, you can say, I completely disregard the input graph. So I throw away all the edges. I have a set of uh, node features. Right? So I work with a set that still inherits this permutation Invariant property and uh, these kind of architectures are called deep sets or point nets. Right, so the special case of GNNs where you don't have uh, any edges. The other extreme is to say that I allow any pair of nodes to interact, so I have a complete or a fully connected graph, and then I learn the right graph or the right way of interaction uh, from the task that I'm trying to solve. This is how transformers operate, and usually transformers are also coupled with positional encoding, at least in NLP applications, because some of the functions that you want to, to, to implement in, uh, for example, when you, uh, when you try to translate uh, text from one language to another, they do depend on position. So they're not necessarily uh, permutation invariant. So somewhere in the middle sit these graph rewiring techniques that uh, I mentioned. So you start with some input graph and you don't completely disregard it, but maybe you want to change it in a certain way. Okay? And we'll uh, see exactly uh, what would be a way of, of doing it. Okay, so that's that's the, the, the kind of landscape of GNNs. But if we take a step back and we consider other geometric objects that we can, uh, we can study under the umbrella of geometric deep learning. So you can think of grids, right, as a special case of graphs. Or you can think of, for example, meshes that are graphs with some extra structure, right? So these are simplicial complexes. You can think of them as graphs where we also have, you also have basically a notion of triangles. So, if I want to implement some form of message passing on these domains, so on grids, I don't have any ambiguity, right? So on grids, I can canonically order all my neighbors because all the neighbors are uh, uh, structured in the same way, right? So I can designate, for example, this to be the first node, right? The, the, the upper uh, neighbor, and then this will be the right neighbor. And this order can be fixed and applied to every node. Uh, on meshes, we have a different situation, so I can designate the first node and then order all the rest of the nodes uh, in, for example, clockwise orientation. But then the choice of the first node is ambiguous, right? So I can uh, do cyclic shift, so I can rotate locally uh, my uh, reference frame, right? And this has uh, to do with the, with the structure group of, of the manifold. So the, the local frames are defined up to, up to rotation. And in graphs, as we've seen, any permutation works, right? So in a sense, graphs have the least structure out of all these, uh, these different objects. So another distinction that you can see is that we can think of grids and meshes as discretizations of some continuous objects, right? So a grid is a discretization of the plane, for example, or a mesh is a discretization of two-dimensional manifold or two-dimensional surface. It's not immediately clear what would be such an analogy for graphs, even though there is an entire field of network geometry that, that talks about uh, continuous versions of graphs, right? And there also is formalism of graph forms and so on, but let's say it's less obvious. So what we would like to develop is some kind of formalism that would uh, be a continuous version of uh, graph in some sense, right? And this is the main topic of uh, my talk that I would like to present today is 
physics-inspired uh, approaches for craft robotics. And basically, for the rest of the talk, think of the following, uh, uh, the following uh, mental picture. So think of a craft neural network as a kind of uh, dynamic system. So every node is a particle living in some d-dimensional space. And it follows a trajectory, right? So these uh, red trajectories, this is basically how the nodes evolve in this space, right? So it is some system described by a system of differential equations that is written here. X here collects uh, the, the, the nodes, uh, the node features as a matrix, right? Assume that we are given some some order to the nodes, right? So we need, of course, to implement uh, uh, everything in a way that is uh, that is respective of the, the of the permutation symmetry. And uh, theta here denotes the parameters, so there is a trajectory that controls this system of equations, right? So what is a neural network? We can discretize these uh, layers uh, in time. For example, we can take fixed time step, and uh, basically this amounts to discretizing the, uh, the, uh, this differential equation, right? Now, what is a graph? In this case, the graph is some kind of complex functions, the function, right? So the, 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 the nodes or these particles, they don't um, uh, live on their own, they interact with each other. And for example, they can, can interact along the edges of the graph, right? So nodes that are connected by an edge will basically, the rows of these matrix uh, in the system of differential equations will be somehow coupled, right? In some way that, that uh, depends on the choice of this, of this differential equation. We'll see that in some cases, we can also consider it is a discretization of some space. So we can talk about uh, about partial differential equations where we discretize not only time, but also but, but also the space. Okay, so and out of, of course, we can consider a zillion of different types of differential equations here. Probably the first most natural thing that comes to your mind when you consider propagation of something, right, of information or some, some property or some, some, some quantity on a domain is uh, the diffusion equation, right? And this is also probably one of the, uh, first rigorous mathematical models that were introduced uh, to study a physical phenomenon by none less than, than Sir Isaac Newton, that um, it was published in the Transactions of the Royal Society anonymously in 1701 in Leighton. <laughs> and uh, there he described an experiment and a mathematical model that, that uh, nowadays we call the Newton law of cooling that tells us that the temperature a hot body loses in a given time is proportional to the difference between the, the temperature of the object and the environment. Right, so this is uh, Newton's law of cooling. If we try to write it on a graph in a local way, this is how it will look like. Right, so uh, x here denotes quantity. Let's call it temperature. Right, so of the node itself. So here it is. Right, so this is the the, the blue is the, the self temperature. Then uh, the temporal derivative is the rate of change. Right, and then the temperature of the environment is just the average of the, the neighbor features. Right. Basically, the, the, the nodes that are connected to, to, to the ice node by edges, right? So if I slightly rewrite, rewrite this formula, I can write it like this. And what is written here is the discrete analogy of the gradient operator that takes information that lives on the nodes of the graph and maps it to the edges by just taking the difference between endpoints. And what is written here is the discrete analogy of the divergence operator. So the divergence operator is adjoined to the gradient, so it goes in the opposite direction. It collects information from the edges that emanate from a node and then uh, makes uh, edge uh, features into node features, right? So combined together, the divergence of the gradient or minus divergence of the gradient, depending on the convention, is called the Laplacian operator. So the geometric interpretation of the Laplacian operator is the difference between yourself and your neighbors. This is what it does. And it appears that uh, this kind of need to, co to compare yourself to your neighbors, well, it's not uh, only what we do uh, every time in our life, this is also this also appears in probably every equation of mathematical physics. So, this, uh, 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 so Laplacian is really ubiquitous and very important operator. Now, um, the, uh, so and this is called the heat equation, right? So this, uh, this uh, partial differential equation where the evolution of the, of the property that, that we're considering, let's say temperature, uh, at every time is proportional to the to the Laplacian. This is the simplest case of uh, homogeneous isotropic uh, heat equation on in this case on graph, but basically this way we abstracted the structure of the domain into the into this operator into this uh, sparse matrix in our case. So um, what is also important about the heat equation that this is a prototypical example of a gradient flow. So what is a gradient flow? It's a continuous version of steepest descent. 
So it's an evolution equation that follows the negative gradient of some energy that I denote here by E. And the energy that is associated with, with the heat equation is what is called the Dirichlet energy. So on the graph, you can write it as this quadratic form with respect to the, to the Laplacian. And uh, we can show that the Dirichlet energy decreases along the flow, and it measures the smoothness of the node features, right? So how different you are from your neighbors, right? And if we allow the, the diffusion equation to run for infinite amount of time, then uh, everything will become constant, right? So like temperature uh, starting from some distribution will equalize on the domain. And this is somehow uh, considered an undesirable phenomenon in graph neural network that is referred to as over smoothing. So this is what is typically cited as one of the problems that makes it difficult to implement deep uh, graph neural networks, that all the features will become the same, right? No, uh, the, the, uh, the, the graph neural network tends to over smooth the features. But on its own, it's not necessarily a bad idea, right? So actually, you can get amazing good results uh, if you do a very simple thing without any learning. So if you know the labels of a few nodes, and uh, you just uh, fix them as boundary conditions and you diffuse them on the graph. And if the graph is of homophilic type, meaning that your neighbors are similar to yourself, you do some kind of harmonic interpolation, right? So it works amazingly well under this assumption. If the graph is not homophilic, then of course uh, the situation is very different and this might be a horrible idea to do. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, on its own, this kind of phenomenon is not necessarily malignant. It can actually be, it can actually be very benign. Now, what is typically done in graph neural networks, right, if we consider them from this perspective, is that in traditional uh, graph neural networks, you start with some evolution equation, uh, you discretize it, and you parameterize uh, the different steps, right? So different, every iteration of this, uh, of, uh, this discretized solver corresponds to a layer in a, in, in a neural network, and you uh, assign a different set of parameters to every layer. What I'm suggesting here is to start with an energy and parameterize the energy, and then derive the evolution equation as, uh, uh, as a gradient flow of this energy. And it offers better interpretability, and uh, in a sense that I will describe in a second, I know that interpretability is, uh, is um, quite a loaded word in machine learning. Basically, what we'll be able to say is that uh, certain behaviors can be avoided, or on the contrary, can be, can be obtained. So basically, it will uh, guide certain architectural choices that otherwise might be completely arbitrary. I should mention, actually, that the first author of the paper sits right there. Um, oh, second author of the paper. So um, basically, this is how it looks like. So um, this is a graph. So this is an example of a graph where uh, a toy example, obviously. So the coordinates of the circle, so every circle is a node. The coordinates represent uh, positions in uh, two-dimensional feature space, right? So these are the, the, the different features of the node. The colors here represent node classes, right? And here, the task is to do node-wise classification in the graph. Uh, so you see that this graph is perfectly heterophilic. So every uh, blue node has uh, only red neighbors and, and, and vice versa, right? So basically, what we are trying to do from this perspective is to find a trajectory, right? So a way of evolving these uh, 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 these node coordinates in a way that we can completely split the red and the and the blue uh, and the blue nodes, right? And you see that we can find such trajectories. So, from basically more formally from the perspective that I presented, we consider an energy that we call the generalized um, Dirichlet energy. So it's parameterized in this case by the channel mixing matrix. So it's how the features interact in the in the Fisher space, and uh, we have two different types of interactions. Uh, we can have attractive interactions that happen along the positive eigenvectors of W and repulsive interactions along uh, negative eigenvectors of W. And this is the, uh, the, the differential equation that corresponds to, to this evolution. So this is the gradient flow of this energy. So you see that if you consider it from the perspective of a graph neural network, when you discretize it, it's a graph neural network of convolutional type, right? Why, why I'm saying that this is of convolutional type? Because the way that you propagate information is in this matrix A. And this matrix A depends only on the structure of the graph. So it's some normalized adjusted symmetries of the graph. It's not dependent on the features. Right? So I always have the same way of aggregating information for my neighbors that is independent of, of uh, who my neighbors are. Right? So this is important, because the folklore states that uh, convolutional type graph neural networks are unable to cope with these kind of uh, settings where the graph is heterophilic. And the result that we show in the paper is that uh, 
this kind of a linear graph diffusion, right? What we can call convolutional type GNNs with appropriately designed channel mixing matrix W, and the, the, the specific requirements is that it is symmetric. That's still guaranteed that it's a gradient flow. And uh, it has sufficiently large negative eigenvalues, so we, we have enough uh, sharpening, right? So the, the repulsive interactions, we can think of them as sharpening. Uh, you can probably avoid overspin, right? So basically, uh, the result is that actually the folklore is wrong. So we can we can uh, work with heterophilic graphs, and this is an example. So this is a two example of a, uh, a citation network that is called Cora. We can uh, control continuously the level of homophily. So going from situations like this where the graph is totally heterophilic to situations like this where the graph is totally homophilic. And you can see that here we have two extreme cases. So one is what is called GCN. So it's a very simple architecture that just averages your, uh, your neighbors, right? So it works very well in homophilic cases. It works extremely poorly in heterophilic cases, right? You're averaging uh, information from neighbors that are completely irrelevant, right? So they have different label. Another alternative is to completely ignore the structure of the graph and just do node-wise classification with uh, a multi-layer perceptron as every node. So you see that, well, of course, it doesn't depend on the level of homophily, but it loses important information about the structure of the graph and the relations between different nodes when the level of homophily is high, right? So somehow you want to be to take uh, the benefits of both worlds, right? So you want to, 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 to work as well as a graph neural network, but to degrade gracefully when the graph becomes heterophilic, right? And that's exactly what, what happens here with uh, this architecture that is based on, on the gradient flow. Now, so far, this was a uh, homogeneous diffusion equation, right? So well, it, has, uh, it has this extra thing of uh, channel mixing, but basically the way that the, the, the speed of diffusion at every point doesn't depend on the position on the on the domain, right, or on the or the node of the graph. And uh, an analogy, if I take a, an image, right, and I subject it to this uh, kind of diffusion equation, this is what I will get. I actually have a closed form solution for it uh, on grids. You can describe it as convolution with the Gaussian, where the the, the, the variance or the, the, the standard deviation of the filter increases with time, right. So if I run the diffusion to infinity, then the Gaussian will become infinitely wide, right? And I will just end up with the average of the colors in the image. So, so if you look at the, the at the kernel of this filter, it looks like this, right? So it's symmetric and it's the same everywhere. Of course, this is not desired, right? In images, uh, if this image contains some noise, so this way I will be averaging out the noise, so I will be doing denoising, but I also destroy these sharp discontinuities in the image that are important for visual perception. So in the 90s, in the, co in the computer vision and image processing literature, uh, came this idea, uh, I think initiating with uh, Perron and Malik, that uh, we need to do some form of nonlinear diffusion. Diffusion that is controlled locally, where the speed of diffusion controlled by the by the by an edge indicator, so a function that is proportional or inversely proportional to the norm of the gradient, right? So the stronger is the discontinuity, the slower the diffusion must be, or maybe potentially even stopping, or maybe even reversing the diffusion. So uh, the kernel of this diffusion equation looks like this. So when I have approximately flat region, I will be the diffusion will look like a normal diffusion, right? So the, the propagation speed will be constant. But here, when I, I come to a discontinuity, I will not be averaging pixels of different colors, right? So I will be here. I will be averaging the the, the black side of the uh, of this edge, and here I will be averaging the, the white side of the edge, but not mixing uh, different colors together. And this was a very powerful idea. You can also associate different um, uh, uh, different energy functions to it, right? So the, in particular for these type of equations, it's the, the, the total variation. And uh, there was an entire flourishing literature and community on uh, energy-based uh, variational and PD-based uh, image processing. So it all, I would say, probably fair to say, wiped out by uh, by deep learning literature because it's conceptually it's very appealing to say that I have some functional that describes how my image should look like. And then I uh, basically evolve the image uh, towards the meaning of this function. In practice, it's very difficult to construct it for uh, any image, right? That, 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 uh, so we, we don't really have a good model of how images look like. So deep learning that, that, uh, are data, that is data driven, obviously, uh, is advantages. So we try to reinterpret some of these approaches in the context of graphs. And we can consider a non homogeneous diffusion on graphs where uh, now we have. Uh, this diffusivity function that is learnable. So this is uh, a parametric function that 
if you implement it uh, in discretized way, you will get a, a graph neural network, right? So this is how it will look like. So it's residual type of architecture. If you discretize with explicit uh, uh, forward order uh, iteration. And under some normalization assumptions, you can actually show that what you reproduce here is exactly the uh, the graph attention architecture with uh, symmetric attention in order for it to be to be a gradient flow. So basically, you see that we can recover some classical uh, graph network architectures as special instances of the diffusion equation. Now, what I promised you in the beginning and I didn't show is um, we wanted a continuous model for graph neural networks. So far, the only thing that was continuous is time, right? So we replace layers with a continuous with a continuous time variable. So you can say, well, not a big deal, right? So what's what's the point? Uh, and if I go back to how the theorem looks like in images, right, to make it more intuitive, so um, the way that we can discretize a diffusion equation on the grid, uh, there is no really canonical discretization of the of the Laplacian operator, right? So here are, are three possible discretizations, right? Or any convex combination of them, because the operator is linear, is also a legitimate discretization of the Laplacian. So what I'm trying to say is that we don't really have canonical computational graph uh, in this setting. And that's uh, exactly towards the idea that we can and sometimes we should decouple the computational graph and graph neural network from the input graph, right? And again, the analogy that we want to take here is uh, it's inspiration from image processing literature. So instead of considering the nonlinear diffusion equation that we've seen here uh, of Perón and Malik, we can consider a non-Euclidean diffusion equation where we think of our image as uh, a manifold that is embedded in a joint positional and feature space. So this was beautiful work of my PhD advisor, Ron Kimmel, and his collaborator from almost 30 years ago in the 90s. And basically by considering the image in this way, right? So if you have an RGB image in this model, it will be a two-dimensional surface in R5, right? Or the, the coordinates will be X, Y coordinated for every pixel and the feature channels are G and B uh, channels of the, of the pixels. Right, so on this manifold, we can pull back uh, uh, the metric from this embedding, and then we can define a diffusion type equation with now uh, a non euclidean version of the Laplacian that is called the Laplace Beltrami operator. And you can show that it's also a gradient flow of a generalization of the digital energy that is called polycore functional. And I think high energy physicists use it to describe uh, something in string theory. So if you apply this idea to a graph, now we have. Uh, Every node has two types of coordinates. So it has the feature coordinates and some positional coordinates. So, and these positional coordinates can be more or less anything. What, what, what is your favorite uh, uh, positional embedding of, of a graph? And then we can apply the, this uh, diffusion equation on uh, both coordinates, again, with learnable diffusivity function. And uh, if you break down these, uh, these joint coordinates, the evolution of x is the standard feature diffusion. The evolution of u, uh, you can think of it as some kind of soft version of graph EY, right? So if we have two nodes that come closer together uh, in this uh, positional space and there is no edge between them, we might want to introduce an edge. Uh, uh, so we facilitate the flow of information. And, and conversely, if two nodes drift apart, maybe we can cut an edge between them. So we don't send information that is useless. Um, and this is an example. So this is animation that, that, uh, that James prepared from our paper. Uh, so this is, again, an example of Cora. So every node here, uh, every node of the graph is represented by a circle. The colors represent the features. So it's kind of three-dimensional projection of the feature space. And the positions represent um, positional coordinates. And you see that there are three things happening at the same time here. So the, uh, the colors are changing, right? So we have feature diffusion. The positions are also changing. So we have some form of uh, uh, the positional coordinates are evolving and also the Connectivity of the graph is changing. So there is uh, some form of graph rewiring happening here. And if you are familiar with the Cora data set, so it's known wise classification into seven classes, and you can see them uh, perfectly highlighted here. Right? So you see, you see that this process produces what is expected to produce. But somehow this is a disturbing picture if you come from the classical perspective of harmonic analysis or signal processing. So you have a filter on the domain that is moving under your feet, right? So it's kind of moving ground. So I'm I'm filtering data on the domain, but the domain is changing at the same time, right? So it's it's disturbing, but it's not disturbing to differential geometers that actually like to take their domains, manifolds, and subject them to these kind of cruel evolution equations like Ricci flows, 
So you start with a manifold and then you evolve its metric proportionally to the Ricci curvature, right? And if you have a manifold that looks like this, like this dumbbell, so it has positive curvature here and negative curvature here, and then you run this, this uh, equation, this is actually shown backwards in time, then you will see that the dumbbell will become more like an ellipsoid than like a, like a sphere and then collapse into a point. And uh, you see that conceptually, it looks very much like the diffusion equation, right? So we have temporal derivative of some quantity, right? And we have some second order quantity that looks kind of like Laplacian, right? So you can relate Ricci curvature to the local change of the, of the volume. And uh, Ricci flows were originally uh, invented by Hamilton um, in order to prove the Poincare conjecture, which you probably know that it, it has to do with characterization of high dimensional uh, topological spheres. And that's exactly the mechanism that was uh, used by Perelman to, to prove this conjecture. And I think topologists were unhappy because the differential geometry solved their the holy grail problem with, with, with uh, techniques that come from, from a different domain. Basically, what does it have to do with uh, craft neural networks? Remember that we talked about this uh, problem that some graphs might be unfriendly for message passing. And this is a phenomenon that is uh, typically referred to as overscoching in the literature. And we can say that this is the failure of message passing to propagate information on the graph, right? In some way. Now, here's an example. What happens in graphs like uh, real world graphs, like uh, small world networks or trees, for example, the volume of the graph grows very fast, right? If I look at the number of neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, it will uh, it, it will increase exponentially, and overscoring will arise when we have these kind of situations of fast volume growth. Plus, we also need for our task to account for long range interactions. So I need to bring information from distant nodes, but the number of nodes is huge, right? So all the information will need to be to be squashed, uh, brought from these neighbors. And this result information will be lost on the way. So basically, you can see that there are two different things that are mixed together here. So there is uh, the graph topology, and there is the task. right? So I would like first to talk about the graph topology. And the way to formalize over squashing is if, let's say, we have a multi-layer message passing type, type graph neural network of this, uh, of this type, right? and let's make some assumptions that, for example, it has L layers, the number of uh, hidden uh, uh, neurons is, is P then the nonlinear functions are Lipschitz continuous with some Lipschitz constant, and the weights are also, uh, also bounded. Then basically, what is over squashing? You can look at the output of a neural network at node i and test how it changes when I change the input at some distant node j. Right? So it's a kind of sensitivity analysis, perturbation analysis. So I, I change one node. I allow the information from this node to propagate to some other node, and then I see what, uh, what is felt at the output. And we can quantify it as partial derivative, right? So this is a Jacobian. And the norm of it tells, tells us the sensitivity. And when the norm is small, we have the over phenomenon, right? So it's insensitivity phenomenon. And what we show is that we can bound this norm of the Jacobian by some constants that depend on the one hand on the architecture, right? Like the number of layers, the, the bound on the, on the parameters, and so on. On the other hand, on the topology of the graph, right? The here, they come across uh, through some power of the uh, adjacency matrix of the graph, right? But this is not exactly clear how the topology affects uh, the over squashing, right? So intuitively, we expect something benign is agreed, probably not to have or to have to less extent the over squashing than something as malignant as a tree, right? Where the volume goes very fast, right? So we need something more nuanced to be able to distinguish between these situations. And that's exactly uh, the relation to. Uh, to what, what I, I showed before, the Ricci flows. So this is what Ricci curvature allows us, right? So on a manifold, Ricci curvature, it can be associated with geodesic dispersion. So I have nearby nodes, I shoot geodesic from them, and I see if they remain parallel, uh, diverge or converge, right? And this allows me to tell whether locally I look like a sphere or like a hyperboloid or like uh, a plane. So there are constructions that are analogous on graphs. So some versions of discrete Ricci curvature. And for example, a combinatorial definition that is called the deformant curvature, it, it looks at a pair of connected nodes and counts uh, certain types of, of rectangles and triangles around it, right? And roughly the intuition is that if I have many triangles, then I look like a clique. If I have rectangles, then I look locally like a grid. And if I don't have any of them and they actually they, these geodesics diverge, then I look like a tree. And we can define a number for every edge of the graph that is an analogy of, uh, of Ricci curvature uh, on this domain. And then 
uh, we have a theorem that associates the presence of strongly negatively curved edges to the phenomenon of over scorching. So there are some graph structures that contribute to over scorching. And then, of course, if we know this, we can cure the graph by, for example, adding edges with higher curvature so we can eliminate this, this kind of problematic edges and make the flow of information better. We actually show that it improves uh, learning on, uh, on graphs, both in homophilic and heterophilic cases. The problem is that it doesn't account for the task at all, right? So this only accounts for the architecture, right? The, the, the kind of neural network that I'm using and the structure of the graph. It doesn't tell anything about what kind of functions I'm trying to implement with this neural network. And I think a good illustration for this problem comes from, from chemistry, right? So I give you a graph that represents a molecule, right? And nodes here are atoms and edges, uh, some abstraction of, of chemical bonds. And uh, in the same mo molecule, I might be interested in different types of interactions. I have, for example, what is called Van der Waals interactions that uh, decay very quickly with, uh, with distance, right? So I think one over r to the, the power of 12. So these are very short-lived interactions. And we have uh, electrostatic interactions or colonic interactions that decay as one over r, right? So they are long distance interactions. So if I were to compute these kind of interactions with the graph neural network that propagates information on this graph, this probably would be very suitable, right? I just can look at my neighbors. I don't care about anything else, right? In this situation, probably I will need more edges to account for the, the, these uh, longer range interactions. And you see here an example, we have the same graph, the same features, but two different tasks. And in one case, the graph might be suitable for, for computing this task. And in another case, it might not, right? So that's uh, basically, that's how the task enters into, into the plane. And this is what I would like to describe. So this is actually a joint uh, work with Petra and uh, Francesco Di Giovanni and other collaborators. And uh, basically we are asking the question of how uh, long range interactions affect um, uh, the possibility to implement certain, uh, certain tasks, right? So what is the task in this case? Uh, it's a function that depends on the features uh, and the graph structure, right? So it's a function that takes as input x the, the node features in our example, and also the structure of the graph. And then the interaction between uh, different node features in nodes i and j is given by this number that we call mixing. So it's um, the, the second order derivative, the Hessian of this function, the, the worst case, right, over uh, the feature channels uh, for this pair of nodes. And uh, you see that we can, well, these are two artificial examples. We might have different functions so this example is fully separable. So in this case, the mixing is zero, right? So there is no interaction between nodes, They're completely independent. And this example where we have, for example, some nonlinearity of the inner product of the features, it depends on how nonlinear uh, this function uh, phi is, right? So different functions on the same graph on the same features might have different level of mixing. Now, what we do with graph neural networks, right? When we try to, to solve learning problems on a graph, we try to approximate these functions with the graph neural network. Now, the, the, the result that we show is that we can bound the mixing of a function by uh, parameters that depend on the architecture, like the number of layers, the bound on the weights, and the structure of the graph, right? So this is denoted as before by green and red, right? So this is essentially the capacity of, uh, uh, of a message passing neural network that is related to the given task through the mixing, right? So basically, I can, the kind of results that we will be, will be obtaining is I give you a task that is characterized through the mixing. I can tell whether the graph neural network of certain type and the graph of certain type will be able to implement it. OK, so that's, that's the kind of result. OK, so here the capacity of MPNN depends on the, on the architecture, right? Like the, the number of layers, the, 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 the hidden dimension, and the topology of the graph, because the graph is part of the, of the architecture, it's the computational graph. And then the task is described through the mixing. And the type of results that, that we consider, well, uh, we can consider the example when we bound the weights or, or when, we, uh, when we bound the, <clears throat> the depth of the architecture. Allow me to skip the details. So in the first case, the result is of the kind weights need to be large enough to allow mixing. In case of a bound on the depth, uh, depth must be uh, comparable to the commute time between a pair of nodes. And we know that commute time in certain unfriendly graphs can be very large. So uh, if we look at the rewiring approaches in retrospective, we can understand why they work, because most of the rewiring methods 
try to improve the commute time. Uh, and we can also come with impossibility results because this commute time can be very large in some graphs. And the impossibility statements basically will be a kind of replacement for the vice fair lemon formalism. Uh, and we can informally uh, characterize the expressive power. The more formal definition is given in the paper is when we have a message passing architecture with certain number of layers and the number of layers typically is order of one, right? So we don't want the number of layers that depend on the number of nodes in the graph. It cannot learn tasks that require certain high mixing among features uh, at nodes with large commute time, right? So this is kind of impossibility statement. So we can characterize the expressive power in this way. So I should say that we completely leave out the problem of generalization, which is another important property of neural networks. So this is a recent paper from my collaborators in China, where we also look at diffusion equations of special type advective diffusion, and they give rise to architecture that is kind of blend between transformers and message patterns. So we have both global and local propagation of information. And we studied the, the sensitivity of uh, these equations to the perturbation of the graph. So we are interested in topological the, the distribution shifts. And we show that this architecture is more favorable. So uh, it actually works very well. And it's uh, another interesting perspective that, that I don't have time to look at. So one last thing that I would like to mention is uh, the following thing. So uh, remember that where we started, right? So different flavors of graph neural networks, uh, basically determining uh, how the information is aggregated from, uh, from the neighbors, right? So basically, what kind of information is sent from every node to, to another node that is connected in the computational graph, right? So this is the what question. What kind of information am I sending? The second question when we talked about graph rewinding is where I'm sending this information. Do I follow the edges of the input graph or do I follow, follow some other uh, graph, computational graph, right? So that's the where question. Now, the dynamic system perspective also adds the dimension of time, right? Because it's... It's a kind of evolution process. So what is missing in this picture is when to send the information, right? So I, I need to know what to send and you know where to send. And this describes the graph neural network. What is missing in most architectures is when this information should be introduced. And in the following sense, so if I look at a classical message passing in neural network and I need to send information from the red node to the green node, it will take me three layers or three iterations, right? So it will further propagate to the neighbors of the red node and then from there to the neighbors of the neighbor of the red node and only there it will hit the, the green node, right? So it will take some time for the information to propagate on the graph. On the other hand, in transformer type architectures, in graph transformers, all the nodes are accessible at once, right? So I can send the information from the red node to the green node in one iteration, in one step. Of course, it might be overwhelming amount of information and it's uh, mixed and entangled with uh, the other features of other nodes. So it might be disadvantages and of course the computational complexity of transformers is, is very high. So what we can do instead is dynamic rewiring where we can introduce this extra information gradually. So we densify the computational graph, not at once like in transformers, but we do it in a step-by-step -step way. And we can also delay this information in time. And this architecture that we call, we call group, so that was uh, uh, work of uh, my PhD student at Oxford. Um, and uh, basically, the, this, this is delayed message passing. So architecturally, as you see here, uh, this is implemented as uh, sparse skip connections. So I allow the propagation of information be between layers, not of all the features, but features of some nodes. And what we show is that uh, it works actually better on long-range uh, long uh, type of tasks, uh, better than, than graph transformers. So this is basically this is the mechanism that, that allows us to, to, to introduce this delay and withhold information for a certain time. And basically, uh, you can think of it in message passing, uh, the information reaches a k-hop uh, node in k steps, but on the way there, it's mixed with uh, features of other nodes. So here in this delayed uh, propagation, we allow uh, this, uh, this feature to introduce uh, uh, untarnished by uh, the information of other nodes at the right time, at the same time as it, it, it would have reached it. So I know that I have my time, so let me summarize. So basically what this um, um, perspective, I think, gives is a different set of tools that allow to, to study and uh, formalize problems like over smoothing, bottlenecks, over scorching, 
you can explain old architectures, like for example, GATS or uh, GCNs, or, uh, as uh, particular instances, for example, diffusion equations. Potentially, you can also design new architectures. Within the same class of architectures, you can make principal architectural choices, like the example of gradient flow. So it's a convolutional architecture, but it has symmetric weights, it has it has residual connections. So uh, basically, you don't need to learn this. You can incorporate it, and you can guarantee certain properties. Uh, so it provides theoretical guarantees, for example, of uh, lack of over, over smoothing and so on. Uh, interesting, probably, results on stability and convergence that can be leveraged from uh, numerical analysis literature. There are deeper links to other fields that are less known in uh, in GNNs. So uh, what I didn't show, for example, you can do more interesting diffusion equations on cellular shifts that are constructed on top of graphs, or maybe more general uh, cellular complexes. And uh, the diffusion equations there have more expressive power. So you can also use this framework as an alternative to device uh, uh, formalism to say that uh, uh, basically how many known classes you can separate by, by means of this diffusion. And then we talked about the, this important difference between the input and the computational graph. And not every, uh, not every graphs are in the same way friendly for propagating information. So uh, rewiring is a mechanism that allows to cure this problem by telling not only what kind of messages to send, but also where to send them. And then the important perspective of dynamic system is that also the time when the information is introduced uh, matters. So I think I will stop here, but uh, I, would, I should say that uh, this is, I think, just the tip of the iceberg. So we did a little bit of work in this direction, and of course, uh, other people and our collaborators. So I think um, I find it very promising. So it's uh, um, an interesting direction that it's hopefully some of you will explore in the future. Thank you very much.